Good morning again. You don't have to say good morning. It's okay. You probably said that three times already. Uh, welcome. And if you if today is your first time, um, and if you want to join a life group, a small group, uh, please join us over there. I, I greeted some young ladies <laughs> who might be interested. Um, you've heard the message today. And Audrey did a, such a beautiful job of explaining the division in the church. And I want to continue on that theme of division in the church and why there was division and how do we correct this problem. Now, um, I talked to one of our brothers in church and uh, we, we talked for a while and the conversation came to a point about sermon and stuff. And um, he says, you know, uh, John, I like your sermon, but I, I really, the, the sermon that I really connect with is Graham's. And I, when, when he preaches, I really get it, and I really enjoy it, and I just really, it speaks to me. And then uh, another brother, at another time, we're talking, and he said, you know, John, they all start the same way. Your, your sermon's good, but <laughs> 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 the way that I learn is like the way that Ron preaches, and it's like seminar style step-by-step step, building block. And uh, I, I really appreciate his, his message. And I'm sure some of you who didn't get the chance to express your preference may have preference uh, over mine to maybe Pastor David or Pastor Adriana when she, she preached once. Uh, I'm sure she'll preach many more times. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, one, can, one can hope, right? Uh, and people have different preferences, learning styles. And they relate to different people uh, depending on their background or, or whatever the case might be. But we don't, what we don't have in our church is a group of people sitting on this side of, of, the, of the pulpit waiting for Ron to come back, right? We want to hear from Ron. I, I'm going to tune out until he comes back. Or, or a group over here that says, you know, <laughs> Graham or death, you know, like give, give us Graham today. Or, or, you know, like children's message is the bestest ever est, and, you know, we're, we're just going to tune into Pastor Adriana only. Uh, that would be quite silly. That would be utterly ridiculous that we would have a group of people exist in that mindset and form. But yet, in the Corinthian church, that's precisely the problem that they had. They had, there were church was clearly split to a point where Chloe's people came um, I, I, I inform Paul of this crazy division in the church. Uh, back in the day, the church didn't have like one singular senior pastor. They had rotating, they had multiple teachers, as we have shared a few weeks ago. And, and so people began to develop taste for one teacher over another. And here, uh, here are the names in, in Corinthian church. One there's a group of people who really were loyal to Paul. Paul was the founding pastor. He was a missionary. He brought the gospel. And he created the initial member, the original few that came to Christ. And they really connected with him. His gentle ways and his wealth of knowledge really spoke to them. And they wanted Paul to be their teacher. And they followed him. Another was Apollos. Um, He's from Caesarea, and he was an incredibly gifted teacher. Not that Paul wasn't. He was an eloquent man. He was in incredibly intelligent. But Apollos had a way of teaching that just made sense. And after Paul left and left the empty vacuum of teaching, he came in and he watered the church. And people really appreciated it. And there's a group that followed Apollos. And the third one is interesting because Cephas is a Hebrew name for, for Peter, one of the 12. But why don't they call him Peter? I mean, if New Testament everywhere else, his name is Peter. Like almost 90, over 90% 90 of the time is Peter. Why Cephas? Well, this group must, must have been a Jewish group, right? They like Cephas. They like the traditional, the original 12, the connection to the Jewish root, and they didn't even call him Peter. It was Cephas, and they wanted him. And we see that Peter has been 
traveling as well, teaching, right? And there's a fourth group who said, you're all wrong, you moron. It's not Paul, Apollos, or Cephas. We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus. And that's the correct answer, right? And they should be uh, applauded and, and everyone should follow along, like just follow Jesus. But Peter, uh, Paul doesn't say, you know, out of four of you, only one group is right. You're supposed to follow Jesus, but he says you're all wrong. And there's a reason why they're all wrong. How can, you, how, can, how can the right answer be the wrong answer? And the, and, the, and the answer to that is the culture in all of us work very powerfully. The culture of this time is that you pick a teacher to follow. They didn't, well, they had Colosseum and stuff like that, but one of the main interests that people had was to connect with a traveling, like a circuit teacher, hear new wisdom new philosophy, new religion, new ideas. And to them, the Jesus group followed Jesus, but only as ideal teacher who brought wisdom for life. And Paul is saying, all of you are wrong. Jesus is not one of your human teachers. He's not one of people who brought pearls of wisdom and just tossing it and throwing it to everybody then how shall we follow Jesus? How can we bring this division into one fold and one fold only so that the church may exist as church? And that is, Paul says, look to the cross. We preach, Paul says, I could have preached in eloquence, but I resolved to know nothing other than Christ who was crucified. So herein lies a problem in the Corinthian church. They didn't mind what Paul had to say about Jesus, or Apollo, or Cephas, or what even Jesus had to say about Jesus himself through the teachings of others. As long as you don't talk so much about the cross. Don't talk too much about Jesus who died on the cross because that's embarrassing that is scandalous that we're part of a religious movement that celebrates and worships somebody who died on the cross and for us it's hard to understand because that's all we know that jesus died on the cross for our sins and cross is something that we celebrate and we have at church but for them in that context in their culture cross was an embarrassment don't talk about it there are other wisdom there are other knowledge that is interesting that all my Greek friends would gravitate towards and agree with, and they will find your wisdom palatable. But don't talk about the cross. And Paul simply says to you, this is foolishness. To the world that is perishing, the cross is foolishness. But to God, to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. They were looking for wisdom. Corinthians were looking for wisdom and power, not in the cross, but nice teachings of Jesus. And that created division in the church. Now, what is, let's break some of these things down. They, they were seeking for wisdom and power, basically, to live their life. And they thought Paul had it. They thought Apollo, one group, another group thought, thought Apollos had it, and another group thought uh, uh, Cephas had it, and, and so on and so forth. So what is this wisdom? Wisdom is, in Greek, Sophia. And that's why we name our second daughter Sophia. Is wisdom is not smarts, but wisdom to know God. It's not gnosis, but it's Sophia, to know God. They, so they, they thought to know God truly is to know rules about God, to know interesting facts about God. And that's all they need to know. We just need to understand who he is. And the power is that its ability to overcome sin. They thought that their knowledge alone would overcome sin and live a brand new transformed life. And Paul says, no, you got it all wrong. 
It is not human knowledge that transforms people. Knowledge alone, having enough information alone is what we're teaching you, but we're teaching you to live life in Christ, to die for you. He died for you so that your sinful self may die with him. This is foolishness. Even to us, it makes very little sense, doesn't it? Be honest. How does death of one person take away the desire and the lust that I have for sin? But Paul is saying that is precisely what this message is about. It's not what you know. It's not what happened. It's not about Jewish customs that you know. It's not about Jesus and all this information that gives you power to overcome sin and live a new life but knowing that Christ died for you and he has put your sin to death. And Paul says that is in the front and center of our message. You find it embarrassing. This is why there is division in the church. You don't want to talk about it because this is not a popular message. Paul addresses the issue then. He says, through Christ's death, that we all have been baptized. And in baptism, if I may um, switch gear a little bit, baptism that Paul is really talking about and is referring to, uh, not only the baptism that Jesus, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but he, the, the baptism that he is referring to is, remember when Israelites came out of land of, uh, land of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. And they came onto the other side, and they were on their way to the promised land. The water split, and everybody went through that water. But nobody, it, it, you never see anywhere in the scripture, as people were walking through the Red Sea, Moses stops them and says, now it's time for baptism. I'm going to push all of your heads into the water, dunk you in, and now you're baptized. And now we go to the other side. That never happened. But why is that considered baptism in the scripture? Because once they crossed the Red Sea and they came onto the other side and the water closed, they can never go back to the land of slavery. And the power of Egypt no longer has grip on them. Pharaoh could not dictate their life any longer. Pharaoh could not tell them to build Pharaoh could not tell them how many children to have. Pharaoh could not tell them that you could only have female children. That power and relationship was severed. And even if they wanted to, they could not travel back and go the other way. And that's what Paul is saying. The death of the cross, death of Jesus on the cross is baptism for you. What he has given to you is that he has severed the power of sin over your life through his death. This is not a knowledge information thing. This is a faith thing in which you practice your life and live into. You can't go back if, even if you wanted to. And that's the power of the gospel. And that's the power of God. And that is the true wisdom of living a new life. Therefore, church cannot be divided. Paul did not die for you. Apollos did not die for you. Neither did Cephas. But if, even if you believe and follow Jesus, but do not hold his death on the cross as being central, then you're causing division in the church. We look at this and we think this story is crazy that a church can be so sharply divided. The word division here is schism, schismatic. That they're not just having different thoughts about these things, but they're utterly severed and separated. People are not, people are, are entrenched in their own camp. And we look at that and say, we would never do that. We would never, Bridgeboy would never have a camp for uh, Pastor Ron or 
Elder Graham or me or Pastor Adrian or Pastor David, we would never, we can't even imagine that happening in the church. However, all of us are in danger of the same division. Because at the core of this division is that I can just know about Jesus. That religion at the end of the day is just knowing, knowing something about this Jesus guy. Having some information about this Judaic religion that we're learning. If you and I are not little by little transforming and practicing our faith from knowledge to hands and feet, then our church today is, at the end of the day, is no better than the Corinthian church, and we're still divided. Imagine, imagine, I, I retire at Bridgeway 10 years from now or whatever. Actually, it would be 15 years, no, 17 years. But let's just imagine, 17 years, we, I didn't get fired, and, and um, all, all of us are here together. And we journey together. We're old. We're all wearing like bifocals. And the young, you know, like, I don't know, Ethan is now elder of the church. Dear Lord, may Ethan be elder. Um, and, and then we didn't change at all. We just have information about God. We're not practicing our faith then we're no better off than Corinthians who are searching for better information. Oh, I relate to Paul's information. The way he says about Jesus, I like it. Apollos, yeah, he's a Gentile and he's so eloquent. I like the way he presents Jesus. I like that kind of information, examination. So on and so forth. If you and I don't put the cross at the center of our faith, which is the wisdom of God. That is a true way to know God, how he loves us, how he sacrificed for us, how he gave everything for us, that through the blood that was shed on the cross was cleansed us from our sins, and that in the same way, our sins were nailed on the cross and we identify with Christ and He alone took away our sins. And that faith is changing us, leading us to practice our faith. There are two things I want us to think about in terms of practicing our faith. There were really three, but I don't... I don't want 10, 30, 11, 36. We'll see. One is, in light of the life group that's happening and the connect group that's happening in our church, we're gathering together because of the cross. We're not in there to integrate into a church, make friends, although that is a happy byproduct. <laughs> Don't you love having friends, people to talk to, people to lean on? But you're more than that. You have fellowship in that group that challenges you to a couple of things. Okay, so I'm getting into the third one. One is the way that maybe you live your life in consumerism. Okay, where did that come from? Well, I, I think it's a big issue in our time. The way we buy and purchase. We, we see the world today river is drying while the ocean is rising. We have crop failures. We have colony collapse of our bees. We have people pollinating, going from flower to flower, tree to tree, pollinating by hand. The things that we never have to worry about when everything was going the way it was supposed to. Not to blame anything and not to demonize purchasing, and capitalism, but we seriously need to look at the way that we purchase, the way we live, the cars we drive, and how we are mesmerized by more things when the world is literally dying and perishing. 
There are island countries and people who live on stilt in the ocean because they don't have national status to enter into Indonesia. They live on water, on a boat, on stilts that they built. And they're joking, but they're, 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 in their joke, you can see the tension that pretty soon they'll be swimming in their living room because the ocean is rising. As you know, I go fishing. And I tell you, before COVID, there was at least a foot more of Lake Ontario where I fish. I don't know what that means. I don't, I don't know if that's caused by climate change, but I tell you, water is disappearing. They say that you can fit South Korea into Lake Ontario. And you multiply that by this much of water. Where's it going? It is alarming. And yet we are eating, drinking, and making merriment and thinking about our next purchase. Christians, Christ died on the cross so that you can live differently. The grip of consumerism over you is no more because Christ nailed it to the cross. Live frugally. Live wisely. Think about your wealth and how it can be distributed fairly and equitably. Second thing that I want to bring up, bring with you, bring to your attention is um, busyness of our life. It's something that I've been thinking about. And um, Graham and I, well, we, we had Presbytery meeting and one of the guest speakers, Sarah Han, and I'm sure some of you may know her and know her better than I do. She's a, she's a former pastor and now she's a professor at, at Tyndale University. And she was talking about how her life was so busy and she was constantly living in FOMO. Is my kids missing out? You know, um, you talk to your friends and neighbor and they're enrolled in ballet or hockey or whatever else, you know, BJJ, and, and, and you think, oh my gosh, am I missing out? Am I, should, should, I, should I not put my kids into the enroll in these things? And what if uh, they miss out in their life? And, and, and it got to a point where it became ridiculous. So she stopped. One summer, she stopped enrolling her kids. She stopped all children's programs and she decided not to have them there. And she was talking to her neighbor and her neighbor came and said, um, that she's a single mother and her neighbor uh, was supposed to send their kids to, to uh, send their son to her husband who are now separated for the summer. But because he was battling with alcoholism, um, he couldn't, he had relapsed and he just could not take care of his, his, his son. And, and she was panicking. I didn't enroll him in anything. I need to work. Um, and, and she's just going on and on. And, and Sarah said, why don't you drop him off at my home? Because we're not doing anything. And she had BBS entire summer with three kids in her house. Laser tag was, and bowling were some of the outings, wonderful, fun outings that she had. But she, the point is this, she could not have done it if her life was exactly the same as the world. But she sees very little difference between her non-Christian friends, the way that her non-Christian friends live, and the way that her Christian friends, including herself, and I'm going to throw myself in there too, uh, way, the way they live. There's a absolutely no distinction between the two. Everyone is busy. What I'm proposing to you through the power of the cross is this, that we live frugally and live simply. Live frugally and live simply. And lean onto Christ and Christ alone for that life. If you, if Jesus is information, yes, he, gives, he loves the poor. Yes, he, he, can, he wants us to live a simple life and we don't do anything then our church is still like the Corinthian church. But Jesus is just an information. This is where a small group or some sort of spiritual friendship becomes so crucial and important. 
We need somebody to point things out to us. Just like um, I people tell me, John, um, your wedding sermons are, are, are too serious. People taught me these things. Um, and it's deliberate. I, I, I can't help myself. Um, there's a reason for that. But anyway, but you need people in your life to tell you things that you do not see. People who can point you back to the cross. People who can point you back to Jesus who died for you. Reminding you, you can't leave that sin behind. Reminding you that you're, you're, you're too busy. You're luxuriating yourself. You're not following Jesus by living like the world, like those loving pointers. That can only happen, that rarely happens on the pulpit. As, I, 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 as much as I would love to say, you know, like, <laughs> Word of God is, yeah, all that is true, Word of God is important, sermon is important, but it's really, you need some sort of close, proximate, like close, colder combat who will fight with you, who will come alongside of you and talk with you, encourage you, remind you to practice your faith, not to give you more information about Jesus, but to practice your faith, challenging you in every way. If we try to get wisdom and power from the conventional places, then we will fail. I like Tim Keller. I like this book. I like this pastor. I like this, this church. And if that's how you get your conventional wisdom and power, then it will fail you. But you must face the reality and look at the cross. That's what Paul is saying. It is the least likely place for people to look. It's the least likely place for people to turn. But Paul is saying that is the only place. That is the power. That is the true wisdom to know God. You want to know God? Study the cross. Look at the cross and look who's on it and look what he has accomplished for you. Christ alone who was crucified. Not Christ alone who teaches nice things because that's already been done. But Christ who died on the cross who has severed the power of sin, the grip of sin in your life and who is leading you, giving you the power to live life of righteousness, living distinctly from the world. Look to the cross. Study it, meditate upon it, believe it, and participate into it and practice what the power, uh, the, practice what the, uh, the Christ cross has given you. The Christ, Jesus Christ who's on the cross has given you to live a new righteous life. Let's pray. Father God, uh, sometimes we get disillusioned with church. And maybe that's because we've been following the wisdom and power of the world. That we look for conventional power and wisdom in the world. That we look to ourselves. We look to more information. We look for, uh, look for inspiration. But if we look to the cross, we see Jesus who has given us salvation by, for free, a free of charge, that he's the one who gives power to overcome the sin and consumerism and busyness and competitiveness and, and, and the anxiety that comes from FOMO, that we look to the cross. Get us to believe, know and believe and lean on the cross. And not only that, Holy Spirit, get us to participate, practice what we believe little by little. Help us to form friendship, spiritual friendship that builds upon the cross. Let us gather together, not for simple, uh, now, for the reason of gathering more information or friendly uh, gathering and, and uh, uplifting of our social life, but let us gather together that we may live in righteous life. 
God, give us friends such as these. Just as Christ was friends to, a friend to us and gave us new life, may we be little Christ to one another. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.